Well, this is a continuation of conservation of momentum. I just wanted to go through a few more problems which may be um, helpful in your understanding. Anyway, we have a, a bus that weighs 15,000 pounds going in this direction and a car weighing 3,000 pounds going in this direction. They're going to have an argument here and become entangled and the car is going to get the worst end of the deal, but we want to find out what happens after they collide. And uh, after they collide, they're going to stick together, become uh, as one, and will move in a different direction, or move with a different speed anyway. Now, conservation of momentum applies during collisions. Uh, and so we'll have the sum of the momentums before equals the sum of the momentums afterward. So the mo momentum before is mass times velocity. So that's the mass of the bus times the velocity of the bus. Plus the mass of the car. 3,000 divided by 32.2 times the velocity of the car. Now again, the velocity of the car is going in the negative direction, so that has to be a minus 4. After they collide, after the collision, then we have mv2, and so the sum of the mvs, uh, or the sum of the masses put together times the ending velocity would be the ending momentum of the system. So solving that for v, we get 3.5. Well, that's not very hard. Um, However, the curious thing is that when you collide, uh, even though momentum is conserved, energy is clearly lost. So let's calculate the energy loss here. Now, energy loss could be calculated by what our beginning energy was and what our ending energy loss. And if there's or the beginning energy and the ending energy, and compare that, and if, you, if they don't end up being the same, then there's some loss generated in the system someplace. So what have we got before? We've got the bus going in this direction, so it has a one-half mv squared. The car has a, it was moving in this direction, so it has a one-half mv squared. So both of those are part of the kinetic energy. Um, there's no potential energy, really. Um, there's no springs or hills to climb, so both the v1 and v2 go away. And there's actually no work either. Um, you could probably consider loss part of work, but uh, it's probably better just to say that there's no friction uh, or pushing or pulling forces during the collision. And so we can compare the beginning kinetic energy with the ending kinetic energy and see the difference, and we'll call that difference energy loss. All right, so we have 1 half mv squared of the bus plus 1 half mv squared of the car is equal to 1 half the masses together times their common velocity afterward, and uh, the residual would be the loss. So I'm just going to fill in the blanks. I got the mass of the bus, one half. Got the velocity of the car, or the bus, five. One half of the mass uh, here times the velocity. And again, the velocity of the car is negative four. And remember, when we square it, uh, this whole term becomes a positive number, which means that energy is a scalar. You just add the energies together. You don't have to worry about positive energy, negative energy, because when you scale it, or when you square them, it all becomes positive energy. At the end, we have one half mv squared, and the beginning, or excuse me, the ending speed was 3.5, and we square that, and we get uh, our loss is what's left. We calculate that, and we see the loss is equal to 3,144 3, foot-pounds, and we can compare that loss with our beginning energy, because this is our beginning energy. If I add those two together, and the loss is 3,144, divide that out, and you get 48% of the energy was lost during that collision. So that's a pretty, pretty nasty crash. Well, what, uh, uh, what if friction was involved during the collision? Uh, let's say that both vehicles were standing on the brakes as they approached each other, and that there's a coefficient of friction of 0 0.5 for each vehicle. And then we're going to apply that during the collision. Let's see how much difference it makes <coughs> to our ending speed. See if that affects our ending speed. So we'll say that our uh, crash happens over a hundredth of a second, 0.01 seconds. So our equation then would be the sum of the momentums before plus the integral of FDT or the, or the impulse uh, is equal to the uh, momentums afterward. So again, before the crash, we have mass times velocity of the bus plus mass times velocity of the car. Again, the car is going in a negative direction. And then the forces of friction, which way are they going? Well, the bus is going this way, so the force of friction of the bus must be going in the negative direction, if I call that positive. So over here for the bus, then I have mu mg of the bus, 0.5 times 15,000. The car, if it's moving in this direction, the force of friction is going to be slowing down, so that'll be in the positive direction. So 0.5 times 3,000 of the car. Add those together and multiply them by 0.01 seconds. 
And then on this side of the equation, I have the sum of the masses uh, times the ending velocity. And the ending velocity is what we're looking for. So if I multiply all that, I get 1965. Multiply all that, I get negative 60. And here's the mass of the, of the system together. And uh, we can say that we end with 3.393. So before, if there was no friction, it'd be 3.5. With friction, it's about 3.4, and uh, so clearly friction does slow it down a little bit. Uh, you may you may determine whether that's negative or not, or uh, whether that's negligible or not. Um, I guess uh, for purposes of our discussion, uh, it does affect it though. Um, and then after they collide, how far are they going to skid? Again, if the coefficient of friction still applies, we have now energy that happens that is calculable after the collision. So this is the T1 condition now is is uh, the sum of the one half mv squared. Um, the work is going to be the friction force times the distance through which we slide, which would be mu mg of the whole of the of both vehicles together times the distance. And at the end of the problem, there's not going to be any kinetic energy or any potential energy. So again, we multiply out. I got the sum of the masses one half mv squared, that's my three point. Actually, I should have put this in there. I should have put 3.4 in there, but I didn't. So 3.4 squared um, minus the uh, force of friction, which would be mu mg, so 0 0.5 times 18,000 times s, and I get that it slides um, 0 0.38 feet. I guess if it only started with 3.4 feet per second instead of 3.5 feet per second, this would be slightly smaller. But. Well, another problem is a classic ballistic pendulum. And what we have here is that the, the bullet is being fired in this direction and it's going to got a block of wood or something here that the bullet buries itself into. And uh, conservation of momentum applies for the bullet and the block together because uh, uh, even though energy is lost during the burying or during the time where the bullet goes in here, but uh, conservation of momentum applies. After the, uh, after the bullet gets buried, then this now has some momentum and it swings up here. So what we're going to try to find is use a combination of energy and momentum techniques to find out how fast the bullet was going. That's really what our question is. All right, so let's look at some, some numbers here. We're going to say the mass of the bullet is 25 grams. The mass of the block is 2 kilograms. It rises from a, from a one meter from the top down here and it raises up uh, to, uh, to a half a meter. So let's start with energy and let's find out how fast the block has to be, the block and the bullet have to be in order to go from here. So what we have is a one half mv squared of the block and the bullet together and it goes up here to the point where it swings up here. So now that all it has is mgh. So what our problem then is, is t1 plus v1 plus u non and uh, is equal to T2 plus V2. And since the only thing we have at the beginning of the problem is one half MV squared of the combo, that's gonna be equal to MGH of the combo. So I can just, uh, the masses end up canceling out actually. So I can say that the velocity of the combo is gonna be square root of two GH and that's 3.132. Taking the combination velocity of the block uh, and the bullet together, I can now go back down to a momentum equation and say the beginning momentum of the system, which is just the bullet, is equal to the ending momentum of the system, which is going to be the block and the bullet together. So the block, uh, velocity of the bullet, the mass of the bullet is 25 grams, times the velocity of the bullet, which is unknown. The mass of the bullet and the block together, times the velocity that I calculated using my energy, and I can find out the velocity of the bullet approaching the block is 253.7 meters per second. I think that's probably the way they do it. Uh, that's, a, that's a real classic and uh, appropriate way of solving this uh, velocity of a bullet problem. All right, the last one I want to talk about here is a, is a um, well, actually I got two more, but let's try this one first. Here's, a, here's an aircraft, a, a Army Air Force aircraft, an A-10, that, um, that weighs 28,000 pounds and it has a Gatling gun that, uh, that um, fires a bunch of rounds and we're going to see how that affects the performance or how that affects the, the speed of the of the aircraft. So the aircraft weighs 28,000 pounds, pounds flies at a constant speed of 375 miles per hour. It fires a four second burst from its Gatling gun. 
The gun fires 13.2 ounce projectiles, so those are pretty big bullets. They're nearly a pound, so they're big and heavy. I don't know what the caliber might be, but they're big. Fires them at a rate of 4,200 rounds per minute, and they have a velocity of 3,200, 3,250 3, feet per second. We're trying to figure out what the plane's velocity is after that burst. What's the deceleration? So anyway, let's do some conversions, and we'll make sure we're tracking on that. 375 miles per hour is 550 feet per second. The, the mass of the airplane, 28,000 pounds, is equal to 869.6. 4,200 rounds per minute is going to be 70 per second. And then the mass of each round, 1,300 ounces divided by pounds divided by 32.2 is 0.0256 slugs per round. So if I find out my beginning mass is this, and the mass of the rounds after their, of, of all the rounds that we shot, are going to be the... Um, slugs per round times 70 rounds per second times four seconds and that gives me 7.168 slugs so setting up a momentum equation then we got our beginning momentum is equal to our ending momentum the beginning momentum is the total weight the total mass of the airplane and and the ammunition times 550 and that's it equal to this would be the mass of the airplane now and we're going to reduce the mass of the airplane by the amount of ammunition that we've just fired so 869 minus the 7 and we're looking for the ending velocity of the airplane and then that's going to be the added to the mass times velocity of the of the ammunition as we fired it so it's going to be 7.168 slugs that happens in that four seconds and we're going to fire it at a rate of 3250 feet per second so 7.16 3250 solving for v2 then uh, I can see that the velocity of the airplane after we fired it is 527.6. We started at 550 and now it's 527. So we calculate the percentage drop and we can see that that's a 4% drop in speed, which is pretty significant. And we can also calculate the acceleration. We can say the beginning velocity is equal to, or excuse me, the ending velocity is equal to the beginning velocity plus the acceleration times time. The time is 4 seconds. The beginning was 550, the ending was 527, and I can find out that it, our acceleration was negative 5.6 feet per second squared, which is, that's a pretty good braking uh, ability of the airplane. It just fires its gun and it slows down a lot in four seconds, so pretty good. All right, the last one I want to talk to you about is a, is a two-dimensional explosion. Now, recall that explosions and collisions are kind of the inverse. Uh, a, a collision is two objects uh, coming together and sticking. An explosion is one object that f that has an, has an internal force that blows them apart. But the math works exactly the same way and the reasoning works exactly the same way. Uh, so what we're going to have is this projectile here uh, going, uh, firing from one spot here and at the at the particular instance it is going in this direction only, going only in the X direction then it's going to explode in midair, and part of it is going to go this direction, and part of it's going to go that direction backwards. All right, so the initial velocity is 600 meters per second going straight in the x direction. That's in the i direction. And uh, it breaks apart, and what we're looking for is the velocity of a. This is a piece a and piece b. All right, here are some details about the masses. The mass of A, which is the, this one on the back end, it's going in that direction, and that's mass of 1.5 kilograms. This mass here is 2.5 kilograms. So I guess I didn't say that, but the, our initial condition is that the whole projectile, the whole round, weighs 4 kilograms and is going at 600 meters per second. All right, let's find out what velocity B and velocity A are. Again, they're going to have X and Y components, and all the momentum equations apply in their respective directions. So in the X direction, I got an MV of the projectile, which is 4 times 600, and that's going to be equal to 2,400 in the I direction, and um, in the X direction. And um, that's going to be equal to, that's my beginning condition, that's going to be equal to my ending condition. And the ending condition is the mass of A times the velocity of A plus the mass of B times the velocity of B. Okay, so um, uh, the mass of A is 1.5 kilograms and we're looking for the velocity of A in the x direction. That's what we're looking for, that component. And the mass of B is 2.5 and we're looking for the velocity of B in the x direction. Putting all those together, I got one equation, I got two unknowns, and so that's not going to be quite enough. 
Let's look at the y equation and uh, let's see what we get there. In the y, uh, we're going to say the mass times velocity in the y direction is equal to the mass times some of the mass times velocities in the y direction. And what did we have in our initial condition in the y direction? Well, nothing because it was going only in the x direction. So the initial condition is zero, and in the in the end, then I've got the mass times I've got mass times velocity of each one. And the mass of A is 1.5, and it's going, and it's given in the problem, the mass of A is going in the sine, it's going in the, the sine of 45, so that'd be sine 45. And the mass of B is going down, and it will be the sine of 30 going down. So VB sine of 30. And what if I got two equations, two unknowns, and I can resolve those uh, equations and find out the velocities of A and B uh, easily enough. So anyway, I didn't uh, work the math for you on these problems. I uh, hope that you can read these pretty well and uh, be able to uh, understand them. So uh, good luck in your homework.